<clears throat> Are you ready? Mm -hmm. And all I ask, Sarah, because I'm yeah. super self-conscious, is if you just don't stand like right behind the camera. If I'm like, <laughs> I don't have to, you know, I don't even have to look at you if you don't. I no, know. Brittany did it one time. Brittany sat right there one time, and I was like, we're through questions, and I'm like, I can't answer any questions because Brittany's like. <laughs> I can't think. Can you put this as the intro so they all know how weird you are? I think the word's already out. Where was the old-fashioned donut when we needed it? I already, I asked them. I, was they gonna said say, I thought you were just going to break my heart and say, I already ate it oh. on the way over. I was going to say, this Q&A, <gasps> this one's done. This is how it's getting hot in here. And this might be the last one. <laughs> we're going to wrap her up at 31. All right. Are we ready to rock? We're ready. Ready to rock? Mm -hmm. Roll, roll. All right. Should I just jump into the intro, or do we, are we going to have some witticisms that are... We already of, got it. Oh, no. It doesn't bode well for mm -hmm. me. All right. It certainly does. Not. <laughs> Not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody. It's Sean from The Good Dog. And this is the lovely Laura Morgan. And this, all of this grandness. Wonderfulness. All this wonderfulness all is this. The Good Dog's Q&A Saturday episode number... 31. <laughs> is it go like that or yeah. should I go like this and you go nah, like... No, it's backwards? Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm still learning this camera stuff. Three, one. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's where you'll be in just a few months. Oh, oh you're great? so funny. How old will you be in a few months? 110. <laughs> Anyways. Anyways. I walked on that one. Okay. <laughs> I thought I could, like, take you off with the knees. And, and, you <laughs> and said, I just, like, yeah. lopped off your head. Yep, yep. <laughs> it was all done. Yeah. All right. Don't let this youthful exterior and these, these youthful hats fool you. A lot of... A lot of miles on that road. <laughs> <laughs> Seen some stuff, been some places. <laughs> a lot of miles. Right? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, we got a loose, we got a loose dog. We have a shadow student right now, uh, Miss uh, the wonderful Miss Sarah, Sarah Prescott. Prescott, and uh, she's in from Massachusetts, and so she's working with a brand new green dog over there, which uh, her name is Laika, if I'm not mistaken. Laika, yeah. And uh, I kind of like her, and she's she's great. And uh, so Sarah's. I think a lot of people would like a her. Oh, so we're uh, working through that. Uh, ooh, I think that we just found the question of the day. Uh -oh. I'm just gonna write it down whilst you entertain the troops. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was hoping for a little more than that. Uh, okay. Oh. Now, that's as far as you go. <laughs> No song. I was getting to it, but it was a quick thing. <laughs> like a Broadway kind of move right there. Is that that's like uh who's that? That's is a chorus line? Is it you jump in the chorus line, right? I always think of like um all that uh, jazz? No, uh what's his face? I'm dating myself. The blue that jazz. the blue eyes guy. He's <laughs> like, I she gets too hungry. Hey, for dinner at <laughs> eight. Gets, hey, nice to see you. You're talking about Sinatra? Yeah. Did he really sing a song about she gets too hungry? She gets too hungry for dinner by eight, right, Sarah? You've heard it, right? Yeah. What is that? My girl. My lady's a tramp. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Wow, I'm learning stuff. Yeah. Look at you. Yeah. Some stuff out. I always sing that song to myself every night. And that's where the clicking comes from. <laughs> yes. Oh, this is a very, very extended intro. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, okay, so we already got. A, I think we got the intro out of the way. So I'm just gonna let you do your mm -hmm. question magic that you do. I thought this. you were. Giving me updates. Oh, oh, oh no, I see. they're they're in there. They're they're okay, cool. they're they're um, built in. Got to, it. Built in. Built into. Okay. Question number one. This is from Susan Savory. Susan's a damn regular on the show. She is a regular. She's here all the time. Hi, Sean and Laura. I have a six-year-old corgi who always loved her crate. I went away for a week, and she stayed at home with my daughter. My daughter goes to school, so she was in the crate longer than usual during the week. Plus, my daughter said the dog missed me as she would pace and whine. Now, since I've been back, she'll go to the crate fine, but when I come back and let her out, she's panting heavily, and there's drool in the crate from her panting. Mm. My daughter said she was fine when she was looking after her. What can I do to correct this? What gives? Uh, Susan Savory. Is it Savory or Savory? Oh, we worked on this before. I think it can't it's... be Savory, right? That would be like... 
like sweet and savory. It could be. So it's probably Savary. Savari. So, Savari, a little, a little more exotic. All right, Susan, you just got moved into the exotic realm. Anyways, uh, getting on to your question, sorry. Uh, so, I, first of all, I wouldn't make a big deal out of it if um, when you come home and if, if you walk in, it can be real easy if you're seeing new behaviors from your dog that you're not, you're not accustomed to. And you walk in and your dog's looking stressed, you know, like tongue, spatulate tongue, like this whole kind of thing. And drool can be easy to get freaked out. And you're like, wow, what's going on? And you can get into a place of really talking to your dog of like, baby, are you okay? And I'm not saying you're doing that, but it's an easy one to fall into if you're mm -hmm. seeing new behaviors that worry you. So make sure you don't do any of that. Don't do any kind of talking to her, any kind of... Um, Consoling, just kind of treat it real matter of fact that you're just in. You walk, you walk home. You walk in. You, you walk, walk home. home. <laughs> you uh, you walk in to your home and you see her in that space. Just be neutral about it. Don't 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 feed anything into it. And then um, what I really think will happen is is that just over time she'll reset herself. I think what's happened is just the combination of you be gone, you being gone, and then her being in the crate for more extended periods of time have just. Uh, just caused her to get a little stressed about it, a little worried, so her, her um, routine's a little off. So um, I think that's probably what's going on, and I, and I would trust that if you just kind of hang in there for a little bit and don't feed anything into it, it should write itself and get into a yeah. better space. Yeah. You agree? Definitely. Anything to add to that? No, I would say it's probably, yeah, it's going to be something that just works its way out. Yeah. Yeah, and that happens a lot. There's mm -hmm. Dogs are like us. They get into a weird funk. Something goes mm -hmm. on. It mm -hmm. sets you off on a weird path. Yep. And then it just takes time to kind of get yourself back, back on on track. Susan, we're out. <coughs> All right, now we've got some updates, and okay. you can just read through them real quick. Okay. Updates. Karen Thompson. We've got awesome Q and A Saturday updates. We've got Karen Thompson says. Sean and Laura wanted to give you an update on my e-collar dilemma with random working levels every time I put the collar mm -hmm. on. Yep, I, I have that. discovered yeah. if I position the collar on the top of her neck, I get more reliable settings. I've also tried my male's e-collar, which didn't make a difference. It's not the collar itself. Thanks for the ideas on this. Yay! Awesome. I wonder if she's saying like at the top, like yeah. up here, like laboratory like I can't remember what kind of dog you have, style. Karen. If it's up here, my I, I would suggest just because that's strange positioning. I yeah, mean, it's, it's cool hard, that you're it's getting. It's also hard to keep it up on that position. If you're yeah. talking, if you're talking up on on the top of the neck, and you just mean the top of the neck, like up here, up here like really yeah, up tight, yeah. that I'm totally down with. But up here, that's a that's a really hard one to keep. The, yeah. the e collar in position. Yep. Yeah. And um, so and you might want to get thick for contact points. I'm sure we talked about this, or longer contact points, or something. Yeah, we don't know lines. what kind of dog she's got. Yeah, let us know. But I'm glad that you're having success. That's awesome. Yeah, but you might get hassled if it looks like some kind of laboratory implanted like you test say it's a animal. GPS. <laughs> say you love your dog. Yeah, it's a it's a satellite dish, and yeah. my dog feeds me well. radio signals while we're out. Anyways, All right. let us know. Let us know what kind of dog you got so yeah. we can make sure there's not a contact point issue. But thanks for uh, the update. We up in the it. mix. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And then our second update is Bethany Wilson Davison. She says, I wanted to give you guys an update from a nervous dog still grumbly in place command with people coming in. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, yep. Two weeks was this of, last week? Or? I think so. It was not that long ago. Two weeks of working with just my husband and I at least once a day on front gate and knocking, then coming in. Mm. I had a friend from out of town over this weekend, and we were all ready for the ultimate test, and mm. not a peep from my dog. What? Once I realized her after, um, released her after we'd settled in, she was her calm, friendly self without the in-between battle. Our guest even commented how calm she was after not seeing wow. um, him for a year. Victory! Thanks for the confidence and guidance, guys. You're the best. Yay! That's so cool. That's really, That's really, so cool. really awesome. That's the old sticking to it plan. Yes. Yep. Yes. So awesome updates from both Karen and Bethany. Yeah. We love awesome. you guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks for checking in. So cool that you check in and let us know what's going on. We really appreciate it. Otherwise, we're just talking to the air. Okay, we Question have... Question number two. <gasps> it's our old friend... Rachel oh. the bear. <laughs> She's... <laughs> Question number two. Rachel Bear says, Hi, Sean and Laura. We have three dogs, two GSDs. Will we ever grow up? No. No, no, just checking. 31 next couple months. Right? And you'll still be... Still be a baby. Rachel the Bear. Yep. <laughs> it's your middle name, though, by any chance. Um, Sorry, guys. We have three dogs, two GSDs, oh. male and female, and a yep. BC Rescue. I'm curious what you'll make of that. 
I was going to say a boxer cub. <laughs> Okay. That was the first. <laughs> oh, I, I, I love I love when Laura has to break down acronyms for dogs. Uh, you know, usually the the famous one was the GSP, which was a German uh, German Shepherd puppy, and uh, so that was that's one of the all time faves for everyone. For <laughs> the first thing I thought of was boxer, and I was like, it's oh, got to be a boxer collie mix. <laughs> I said cub, a cub. <laughs> it's a it's a puppy. It's, it's a, a boxer cub. <laughs> Okay, so the male... From Rachel Bear, of course it's going to be a cub, right? Cub. Of course. Ma All right, guys, let's get serious. The male GSD and boxer cub are best butts. The female GSD and boxer cub are nervous and unsure of each other. <laughs> the female GSD, when unsure, will bite, usually if the border mm. collie is excited, nice and then work. the border collie will bite in reaction. I got some help over there. Mm. Inside, um, where energy is strictly controlled, we have gone many weeks with no bites and no problems. Outside is more difficult. My question is, what kind of things specifically can I do to help them make, uh, be more comfortable with each other if the border collie is excited mm -hmm. and eliminate the fear reactions? I can't always tell what specific behavior will provoke a bite, but I'm sure, pretty sure that given a choice, the border collie will avoid rather than bite. I'd like to have them all off-leash and comfortable as pack. All are e-collar trained. Thanks for any help you can give boom, us. Boom, boom with all of them being e-collar yeah, trained. Yeah, she's a badass. It's so she's great to like, answer questions from like all these folks that have done all this yeah. hard work. Yep. Okay, Rachel the Bear. Um, <laughs> let me just jump into this. Uh, so seeing as all the dogs are e-collar trained and you got a bunch of leverage, you're really like kind of way ahead of the game. It gives you a lot of options that other other owners wouldn't have. Yeah. Um, so, so I'll give you two, two things that you can do. One... Not my favorite, but is um, a little bit more of the low impact version, which is uh, manage the border cal border callies, uh, the border cubs, um, excitement, anxiety, stuff like that. And you, you can use the e collar to just kind of keep the dog at a little bit more of a moderate level. It's pretty challenging though, especially if you have a dog that really likes to cut loose and have fun, and and it basically means you've got to like inhibit that <laughs> that kind of like exuberance for life mm -hmm. um, for life and that's that's not um, you know that's not something I'm a big fan of but I, I know that some folks would recommend that so I'll put that option out on the table if, if it feels more uh, realistic to just manage your border collies kind of energy level so the other part of this would be that um, you can actually address it head-on but this gets a little more dicey this is a little more challenging and and to be honest I'd, I'd rather you have somebody uh, a professional dog trainer that knows how to handle the stuff with you if you can um, it just always sets you up for a, a safer more successful situation mm -hmm. so I I just preface it with that and if you're determined to try and take a shot at it yourself then you just have to make sure that you you really go to um, all, all the links to make sure you, you have safety precautions in order which all your dogs are e-collar trained so then I would suggest you muzzle condition at least the German Shepherd that's been attacking um, and possibly the Border Collie if you think the Border Collie will reciprocate under stress. I know it reciprocates under full attack but you have to decide if it will reciprocate under distress. Um, if that's the case then they both need to be muzzle conditioned. Um, you can look up our friend Josh Moran's um, e-collar uh, conditioning video. No, muzzle conditioning I'm video. I'm sorry, yeah. yeah, muzzle conditioning video. Um, he's the, named the, the barefoot dog trainer. Um, but just look it up on your YouTube and you should be able to find it. It's a fairly straightforward approach to be able to muzzle condition your dog, which means basically that the dog is comfortable with the muzzle, not stressed or freaked out about it. And so you can actually start to work with your dog safely in situations without them being stressed or freaked by the muzzle and you'll get more normal reactions. Now that all said, I would put a long line on the German Shepherd and I'd set up the situation where typically you might have trouble. Maybe it's out in the backyard or something like that and allow the Border Collie to get worked up. And uh, the German Shepherd's got a muzzle on, has a long line on, and the moment you see that kind of like tension, that pre-tension, um, the stuff that you know is like, wow, that's the precursor and we're like a, a, a hair away from, from trouble, or you actually see the attack where the, where the Shepherd goes after the Border Collie, that's when I would do a major correction with the e-collar, high level correction, and I press and hold. I know it's kind of like rough stuff, but we're talking about like keeping your dog safe and trying to move past like management. We're trying to create inhibitions, and um, this isn't this is not for everybody. And you'll hear trainers that would um, guffaw at, at, at what what I'm talking about or, or have a, have a have an issue with it. But I know that if you can create inhibitions for her. 
about her choices. So she's uncomfortable when the border collie is excited. And then she says, the easiest way for me to deal with my discomfort is to attack the border collie because it, it helps me release all this stuff. Mm. But if you can actually correct the dog at a level that is, is valuable enough for the dog, the shepherd, then the shepherd goes, I feel this discomfort when the collie is excited, but I've been corrected when I made a bad choice and now I'm gonna actually do better work and I'm gonna hold myself back and restrain myself. And if you do it right and you do it with a high enough correction and you keep everybody safe, you can really move through the process where the dog goes, I don't really dig the cut of that border collie's jib, yeah. but I'll just hold myself back and maintain and manage myself. So that's a higher, like more complex, uh, and that would be a good one that if you're gonna try and do it, like if you want to do a, like a, a phone consult with one of us, um, here, that would be a, a good one to get like details about how we'd walk you through the process because like I said, it's it's a, it, it's a little more of a, of a riskier kind of interaction, of course, um, but you wanted to know like what would I do to actually try and fix it, not just kind of like manage it and that's how we do it here. We set those situations up. We had a situation just like that today with the resource guarder that we had to work with with other dogs and, and create that inhibition about mm -hmm. I know that choice you want to do don't do that choice anymore. So that is the the answer to that. Did I, did I cover everything? Yeah. Get into all that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit of a complicated one, but... It is a complicated... And that's what I was saying. If you would want to do like a phone consult, you know, um, that's something we could walk you through with a little more detail and or make sure... Or if you sure. have a trainer that's nearby. Yeah, know. even better. If you've got a trainer nearby, grab grab them, but you got to make sure they know how to do this stuff. And if you grab somebody who's not a balanced trainer, they'll, they're going to think that you're doing the worst thing in the world because <laughs> they don't understand any of this stuff. So, yeah. cool. Cool. So let us know how that goes. And I mean, from everything you've done so far, you're, you're, pretty, you're pretty adept at, at working with your dogs. So you uh, hopefully have a good shot at making this stuff work. All right. Question number three. This is from Lacey King. Yeah. Lacey says, Sean and Laura, I have a hey, female Lacey. Australian shepherd who will be two years old in July. Mm -hmm. Knowing the breed about being protective of their owners and home, I've tried to do as much socializing as I could when she was little. She was so beat up and friendly. Wait, no, she was so upbeat. <laughs> That's the best way to, to be. I mean, if you're going to be beat up, be friendly about it. No, I, I don't know why. All right. She was so upbeat and friendly. Yeah. Um, was always eager to see people, but now she has become more protective of her yard and while we are on walks. She barks at people when they're outside by our yard. She normally stops when I tell her to, but what I really want is help on our walks. When we're walking, she's good until we see someone walking or riding a bike. Then she starts to whine and growl and bark and kind of pull towards them. I use a halty because I push her stroller at the same time and she has no problem mm. with it. Mm. When she sees the halty, she knows it's walk time. Blah, blah, blah. So basically freaking out while on a walk. Yeah. Yeah. And lazy. like protective. Yeah. Kind of like just, would she say she's two years old? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the time when all yep. the fun starts coming out. So uh, guess what? This uh. is Laura's... <laughs> Corner. So, I, I can't remember what my my acronym stands for here. Laura's Laura's secret. secret? Laura's secret surprise question. Oh, yeah. Like L S S Q. <laughs> so Laura has to jump in. This is a new little thing we're doing uh, here, where Laura doesn't get any prep. I have she to just, read the question. She just has to jump in. So, I have to uh, actually pay attention. You can't just read stuff. So we've got we've got okay. a border collie. I mean, um, we've got we've got a, an Australian Shepherd. Australian Shepherd too. Yep. Okay, so this to me is pretty easy uh, because you're just on a halty. So a halty, um, you know, you're gonna have some control, but you're not gonna have total control, and you're gonna you're not gonna be as connected. So you've got an Australian Shepherd who, in in what I've seen, Australian Shepherds, especially around that age, if they haven't had a ton of direction and they're prone to more nervous anxiety stuff, they're gonna become protective which can lead to even worse stuff. Uh, yeah, they get super nervous. Yeah, yeah, super nervous. So what I would do is at least switch to a prong collar. So if she's a, you know, a small Aussie, actually I would just go with a medium prong collar, 3.0 millimeter. You can get it on Amazon or, or uh, dog.com or, you know, dog.com, that sounds good. 1-800-PetSupplies.com. Um, and then, you know, it, the prong collar, you can go to our prong collar video and learn how to size and fit a prong collar. It's on our website. On our website under free how-to videos. And then you can also learn how to walk a dog on a prong collar. It's also on our free how-to videos. 
Um, and if that isn't enough, you can move to e-collar training. Um, but I mean, you can start, yeah, start with a prong collar. If you feel like you're not getting with using the way the techniques that we say in our video, not just slapping a prong collar on a dog and just moving into it. Yeah, you gotta watch. You gotta watch how to how the, the the videos of how to size the prong, how to how put to it on, it, how to fit how it, how to get it, the dog started on it, all the things to kind of lead up. And then there's up. the video of the walk and where then, it shows you how to do it. Mm -hmm, and then correcting, you know, stuff like that. Um, but the thing about this, honestly, Lacey, like what I would do is a full go full e collar. Go all the way. I was way. hoping you'd go there. Of course. I was hoping you'd go there. I mean, yeah, I'm just saying she's on a halty, so she's like one step would be good. Yeah, but I mean, you could even use a halty and an e-collar. Yeah, sure. You, know? you could do that. Um, the problem is that the dog's just kind of like isolated from her, not getting information. You know what you should do? You should buy our e no. You should buy our prong DVD or go to our free videos and do the full prong foundation in our free videos. You kind of have to piecemeal. It's not as in-depth as the DVD, but you can still get it from there. Um, if you want to go with the DVD, it'll go more in-depth. One of those two things, one is free, one is not, but they're both relatively cheap. One is definitely One's cheap. really relatively really cheap. cheap. <laughs> and then after that, go to our free how-to videos because our e-collar DVD isn't out and do e-collar training with the walk and place command and recall because the the thing the reason why I'm kind of like thinking as I'm talking is that you've got now you know why I take notes right no I mean it's, it's hard stuff it's easy yeah Ooh, okay <laughs> just kidding it's not easy. um the thing is that you've got a dog that if this was just pulling and kind of whining I'd say yeah prong collar or just get an yeah. e collar trained for the walk. If you have a dog that's two years old, that's already starting to be protective and starting to lunge and starting to like it's do not that just stuff, on the walk, yeah. it's going to be everywhere in your guys' life. So it doesn't, these behaviors don't just live on the walk. We don't get clients in that say, we get tons of clients in that say, oh, the walk is the biggest problem and he's great inside the house, but we don't just work on the walk. We, in fact, work more on the stuff inside the house so that the dog's used to being calm in every single situation in his life. So, yeah, that's what I would do. Do prong foundation first just to get your feet wet with that stuff and then go to e-collar pretty quick. And the, and the, the, the good answers, um, the, the, the thing is what we find with reactive dogs is that there's very few things that really calm them down like the e-collar mm -hmm. does. So when especially we, those when, guys. Yeah, whenever we have reactive cases like that, especially with what you're talking about, we go to e-collar straight away because it really helps dogs break through and calm down. It's not about blasting dogs. It's about getting them to calm down and relax. And if you if you check out like our e-collar heel video and just kind of watch Fusa as we're working with her in the video, you yeah. can really see the difference. Fusa came in being like super dog reactive and being nutty in general. Yeah. And, and the e-collar work will really like turns that around so I uh, you know I'll, I'll, I'll uh, just kind of let let Laura's answer stand and, and mm -hmm. just say that I would definitely lean towards e-collar work yeah and if you really want to like have a dog that you're comfortable living with for the rest of your life or the rest of the dog's life yeah is e-collar work in totality because then you can get rid of some of the guarding stuff at the house the yard all that stuff yeah. then you can correct your outside you see through your kitchen window dogs being nutty you can correct for that and dog is oh I can't be nutty at the gate anymore yeah. or at the fence anymore and you yeah. can really start to create some really nice stuff. Yeah. Cool. There you I go. I like those little surprises, huh? Thanks. I like them. Thank you. I like them. Okay, question four. This is from Debbie Surzan. De Surzan. Surzan. Debbie says, our almost two-year-old male has some issues with submissive peeing when my fiancé tries to bend over and kiss him on the head and ask the dog to give him kisses. Mm -hmm. Sometimes giving him treats or sometimes I should have given you this calling him to come with him. Mm -hmm. He tucks his tail and pees, and when we tell him to go outside, he'll sometimes drizzle as he goes, making it much more difficult to clean up. Oh, that's so frustrating. Drizzle really is only good if you're like talking about like the frosting. On top of a, a yeah, yeah caramel like on top of a ice cream. Yeah. yeah. He does it often enough that we had to buy a carpet shampoo and it's getting really annoying constantly cleaning up pee drizzle throughout the house. <laughs> We don't really understand why he does this or gets him to, or how to get him to stop. He's only done it to me a few times, and usually if I'm giving him a really good treat like meat or ask for a kiss first. Oh it's, most, it's mostly kisses. It's mostly kisses. 
he does other tricks. It's just funny because it's like <laughs> Debbie, Debbie, Debbie. Debbie. Um, he does other tricks for treats with no problems. So no pee with with the tricks. I'm concerned that Debbie hasn't been a long time fan or a reader of our blog. Debbie. We're not calling you out, Debbie, but I'm just saying I'm I'm suspicious about how long you've been watching. He occasionally does an excited pee too when people come over. Although he's gotten better with that, would appreciate any advice. This is one of the, the tough one if you haven't been, you know. No, of course, the... and and I'm just I'm just teasing. Yeah. But um. So what I what I suggest is that we stop kissing him. <laughs> Right? It sounds really simple, but the thing is, you guys are you guys are prioritizing something that you enjoy. You enjoy that interaction and, and kissing him on the head. And what happens is when you go to kiss a dog on the head, you lean over the dog and you put, apply a lot of pressure to the dog. I don't mean actually touching them, but physical spatial pressure. You apply a lot of that, and that causes a lot of dogs with submissive, nervous, insecure peeing to drizzle. Yeah. And, um, it's not comfortable for them. Yeah. So my point is exactly what Laura said. My point is that we have to prioritize what's comfortable for the dog, not what's comfortable for us. Mm -hmm. So even though that's something really fun and you really dig it and, and your, your fiance enjoys it as well, it's not something that your dog is enjoying. And he even may wiggle and do sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. But at some point when the pressure gets too much, you're seeing that release of pee. And, um, it's it's not that uncommon of a thing and what you have to do if you want to get off the pee pee train is you got to just stop doing the stuff that causes your dog to be overwhelmed mm -hmm. right so if that was my dog i would say okay i can't do that stuff at least this point in my dog's right life now. right yeah, it doesn't maybe have to be forever. maybe two and a half maybe three my dog gets over it and we can mm -hmm. work through it but right now it's too much and he's just mm -hmm. telling you it's too much i can't i can't even contain myself yeah. so um, so i would i would get rid of the kissing on the head um, i'd get rid of a lot of like big excitement stuff and i mean it sounds like so we've got like high value treats and meat um, kisses it sounds like it's a pretty like excitement real like deeply like affectionate <laughs> kind of interaction and there's nothing wrong with affection with your dogs but you have to make sure that it's not like that you're celebrating your dog so much that your dog is like ah <laughs> okay, you have to make sure it's not undermining the dog's comfort That's, and where yeah. they're where they're going so it doesn't again doesn't mean that it's forever it may just be right now in your guys's it's relationship still young. It's still young. yeah that you guys need to like come off from that a little bit apply Give, give a little bit more boundaries, make him more comfortable by giving him, okay, this is where, you know, you can do some of the work that we, we suggest was like place command, yeah. making sure he's walking nicely on a walk, things like that. But all that sort of affection stuff, even though he may enjoy it, it also could cause things, what we see like separation anxiety, dogs getting mm. so anxious and nervous. Yeah, yeah, dependency, but dogs even getting nervous or like, too much with the owner so that they're not social with others. So yeah. we just want to make sure that you're not, um, cause we know you love your dog. We just want to make sure that you're not doing something inadvertently to, to cause prob more problems down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Just from all the clues that you shared, it sounds like a lot of like, boy, we, we really like to do this with our dog, but like, he's kind of like struggling with it. So it's, it's, we kind of have to adjust what yeah. we're doing. Like Laura said, and, and I think I said the exact same thing which is um, prioritize what's comfortable for your dog and avoid those interactions that are overwhelming him. So I practice more low key stuff. Doesn't mean you have to be a zombie, mm. but it just means like, okay, we got this young guy and he's pretty sensitive and he's a little submissive. And when we lay too much excitement, too much like excitement can be like, you know, too much attention like that or affection, kisses, food, things like that can just, oh, I just can't control myself. So that's what's going on. So let's take it all down a little bit. Let's d be very cautious about, especially with your fiance, it happens with males all the time, leaning over the dog. That's so much pressure on the, on those guys. So I would get rid of all that stuff for right now. Just be very conscious of it. And then as your dog gets older, you might be able to get back into that stuff if your dog enjoys it, if it's not just stuff for you, but your dog actually enjoys those interactions, then you can kind of see if he can do it without having the uh, urinary um, yeah. dispensing, you know, going on. Yeah. So you kind of, it's one of those things that the reason I said like, oh, it doesn't sound like, you know, maybe you've been listening for a long time. I didn't, I don't mean it to be like harsh, but just that it's, it's kind of a very basic um, one of like, 
kind of we're just getting wrapped up in our own stuff and not really seeing what the dog yeah. is needing. So, and, and it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it because now you're empowered to kind of see this in a greater context, not just with like the peeing, but also like, okay, how does how are all of our interactions working with our dogs? Yeah. Is it helping or hindering? It helping? It's a good thing to always be conscious of for, yeah. for anybody. So thanks for the question. Yeah. Okay. Question number five. This is from Brianna Gordon. Brianna Gordon. Brianna says, Hey, Brianna. I have an 18-month-old foster dog who growls and shows his teeth at dogs who are inside his crazy bubble, but he's mostly non-reactive. Did, Did you read my post on crazy bubble this week? Oh, yeah, uh, that's yeah, right. She's okay, crazy look bubble, at that. Right? It's all the world's yeah, tying together, right? But he's mostly non-reactive when he sees dogs at a distance. Mm -hmm. I know it's just fear and not aggressiveness because his first owners let their own dogs pick on him. Oh. Um, okay, after 24 hours of slow introduction, he mellows out and loves to play with the new dog. How can I get him to trust dogs again so he can enjoy social interactions? Brianna! Okay, your dog does enjoy social interactions, right? It's just that he doesn't enjoy them in the way that you're initially setting them up or, or wanting him to um, on leash. So do if, if we're talking about on leash stuff, dogs on leash feel... Uh, tend to feel pretty darn uncomfortable and trapped and stressed out. And if he's had past negative experiences with dogs, there's no better way for a dog to be stressed and like growl and show teeth and be weird than when they're on leash because they can't practice natural, normal behaviors of like, let me move around this dog, let me, you know, like do whatever I would normally do as a dog to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see a lot of uh, more stressed out, anxious stuff, which is going to lead to worse choices from your dog. Yeah. But what you say is that if given 24 hours and allowed to warm up to a dog, he does really well and he's playful and he's really cool and all that. So the, the upshot is that he is social. He just, we, we kind of need to honor who he is and he's not the dog that, that's, that should be going up. We don't recommend any dogs on leash or going up and greeting unless you've got like besties that yeah. you know in the neighborhood that your, your dog and this dog are like, oh, we love each yeah. other. But otherwise, that concept of like, I want my dog to have a social interaction on leash is a really negative one for 99% of dogs. So if that is what we're talking about, I'd love for you to take that off the plate because it's not, it's not serving your dog or honoring your dog. He's already showing you that those interactions are uncomfortable for him. And I don't mean that to be harsh. I just mean that we kind of have to let our dogs tell us what's cooking, right? We're like, well, I want him to have friends. But he's like, man, I don't like having friends like this. This is really uncomfortable. But if you invite the friends over for a while and I can get to warm up with them, you know, have a beer and have dinner, I get comfortable and then I can like actually let my hair down and play with them. And so that's, that's what I think we need to honor is that you actually have a social dog. Yeah. Like you don't have a dog that's like off leash. He's like trying to nail other dogs. He's just like, I just need more time. Yeah. So honor that he's a little bit of a slow warmer and allow that to happen, and then don't put him in places or positions on walks where he's forced to be uncomfortable and, and interact with dogs that he a, doesn't know or doesn't feel comfortable with, and really, really advocate for him, and you'll see better stuff with that. Dogs, the reason we call it the crazy bubble is because when dogs encroach in that space, they make other dogs crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it makes other dogs uncomfortable. So I'd really love for you to, um, to prioritize not letting that happen, advocating, keeping him comfortable. It sounds like you got a great dog. Mm -hmm. And uh, let him warm up slowly and, and make friends like that. But the whole, the whole notion of dogs being social on leash and having neighborhood friends yeah. is 99% is of the time a, a bad idea. Yeah. So that's yeah. my answer to you. Okay, question number six. This is from Danielle Flynn. She says, I have a six-month-old Great Dane puppy. She's mm -hmm. starting to turn a corner on her misbehaving puppy phase. She still likes to chew on things such as her bed and her belongings. Two minutes after I tell her no for a bad behavior, which she stops right away, mm -hmm. she will go back to doing it. <laughs> I buy her toys and chewy stuff. Any advice on what to do so I'm not constantly telling her no all day? I use a training collar and crate her. Should I use the collar to correct her behavior or put her in a timeout? Mm-hmm. Danielle, welcome to Puppy Land. <laughs> um... Yeah, so part of this just comes with the territory, right? When you have young dogs, they're going to do a lot of this stuff. And uh, that's why a lot of people aren't into puppies, you know, because it's a lot, a lot of work. Um, you're at the six-month mark, so it's you're over some of the humps, but you still got a fair amount to go. So 
teething, chewing, destroying, destructive stuff, that's that's a pretty pretty common thing. Yeah. Um, what I would say is definitely let's use that um, training collar. And I, I'm not a big fan of timeouts. I really don't think that they work very well. I don't think they connect the dots for a dog about what's going on. But an in-the-moment correction for you pick that object up and pop and goes, ooh, I'm not supposed to do that, that's very clear. A lot of clarity and, and good information for the dog about what you want and what you don't want. So I would definitely do that. I would ixnay on the, I don't know how to say, um, out, I'm tay. Oh, that tay. one's hard. Yeah, yeah that's a hard yeah. one. Um, but I oh, would. Oh, I'm tay. I don't know the out. Ixnay on the. I'm tay, out tay. I don't know. Ta, ta. No, I'm out. Okay. I don't know. So um, I, I, what we're trying to say is no time out. And, um, and then the other part of it is got to have to really keep your eyes on them for this period of time, right? So if you can't watch, it's better to crate them. Um, you can always tether them to you, which is kind of a pain, but you can take like the leash and you can tie it to you or even a longer line, you know, like a 15 footer, but you can just take, take leash or a 15 footer, tie it to, to your waist, and then you can keep the dog close to you so you can keep eyes on when the dog's, I mean, that's kind of the gig with puppies. You have to watch them constantly and help cultivate good choices because they, they just, they're puppies, they don't, they don't know, they don't know what to do. Um, and then when you're not supervising, you can't, can't keep eyes on, create that dog up. Let that dog have some downtime. It's great for puppies to have downtime. They don't need to be out roaming and foraging for, for trouble all the time. <laughs> they really need like, great, here's some out time. Now go be quiet and relax. And, and that really helps move them into adulthood, into a good space where they're used to having like on and off, on and off, on and off. And like, what the hell? Like get some place command. Ooh, I broke my pen. Get some, I was really <laughs> angry about that one. Get some place command. I was like, get some place command. <laughs> get some place command um, for your pup. I mean, pup is at a perfect age. I mean, you could even have started earlier, but a perfect age to start yeah. getting some stuff on on the on the on the on board or on the train. Yeah. But if you did place command, what you got a training collar on, and you did place command, and you taught that dog who's like he's a puppy, but he's moving into adolescence, yeah, Danielle, right? Yeah, Danielle, six month old Great Dane, yeah, should so fully e collar train this dog. <laughs> this is not a no. I'm yeah, I, it's not I a know puppy. You're getting into yeah. that, but yeah. this is like we're talking like six month old. I mean, that's like, that's getting out of puppyhood and it's a great Dane. Yeah. Like you're going to have, give you two months and you're going to have a wild, almost ah! <laughs> nutty young dog on yeah. your hands. So yeah. let's get, Now's you know, the time. Yeah. You might yeah. as well. We, we, we'll do e collar training on dogs this age all the time. Oh yeah. I mean, we'll start at four months. Yeah. So, so you're just doing low level training and you're just doing it you know it's low level and but she's not, not really she's not even really using the the prong collar i don't think very yeah. much from what it sounds like so if it is a prong collar yeah he said training collar or... so who knows what it is exactly but yeah at six months it's time to start shifting out of like puppy mode and yeah. start thinking this is an adolescent dog yeah and that Especially means that big dogs like yeah that, we so. got to really start start creating some boundaries and structure yeah. for that dog like most of the dogs that come in here have the same issues. They're counter serving, they're destroying things, they're getting into trouble. We teach them a few simple calming exercises like place command, like duration place command. And so much of that stuff goes away, not just because they can't get to the objects yeah. because they're in place, but because they, for the first time in their life, learn how to self-soothe and relax and chill out and just be calm. So if you want your life to get better, use the prong collar to correct for any untoward action. You can even set it up, put stuff around them. Um, crate when you're not ready to supervise uh, or not able to supervise. And then teach a basic place command and like teach it rock solid with the, the leash and training collar. And man, you're gonna see this thing so much mm -hmm. change so dr dramatically or drastically or dramatically. You're gonna see it like really change. And um, like a teeny bit of training like that will change your world. So. That's unless you have something else to offer. No, it's good that you jumped in. Laura yeah, was like, to. "They call that sucker I up." I mean, just think like he's gonna be awesome. But You're he could also be a giant pain in the butt if you don't get a jump on this, That's right? What I'm saying, Training like, him at a year really is gonna suck. Yeah. If if he's had a lot of time to practice negative habits and get in the get in the feeling of like, yeah. I can kind of do this and mom all she does is warn and say no and so there's not really accountability and there's not really rules here even though mom wants there to be rules they're not really much that I'm honoring or respecting so let me just see about chewing on the table or jumping on guests yeah, yeah. or growling at people all sorts of stuff yeah. can go on so let's do a little preemptive strike and uh, all the stuff we just talked about but get on our website www.thegooddog.net and look at the free do-it-yourself videos, and at least, at the very least, get the dog place command. But if you really want to bomb, you know, like really make this nice, it's so easy. In like 
two weeks, you could have them fully trained on, on the leash and prong. You could have sit down, place, uh, work on heel and thresholds, and like be like a different dog. Yeah. Totally different dog. You haven't really given them enough direction, I, and I don't mean that judgmentally. I just mean knowing if you haven't done a ton of training, it hasn't had a lot of yeah. direction. He's just loosey goosey. He's like puppy, yeah. like oh, let's do yeah. this, and oh, oh, let's go in here and stuff yeah. like that. So, all right, that's your answer. Cool. <laughs> okay. Question number seven. This is from Wendy Miller. Our old friend Wendy Miller. She's been around a lot too, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of these people. Have... They know. Wendy. They know where the good stuff's at. They know where their bread's buttered. I don't know what that means. I just said it. Okay. It kind of goes with Wendy. She knows where her bread is buttered. <laughs> hey, how you doing? <laughs> okay. I have, two I have two, two <laughs> dogs, and they play well, coexist together. Uh -huh. However, one of them, the submissive one, can sometimes resource guard. I feed oh, them dear. separately, but if there's a crumb of anything left on the floor, <clears throat> she will guard it and start a fight with the other dog, and it can get bad. She'll also sometimes growl when the other dog comes near her crate. I do all the basics in terms you teach in terms of leadership. Both are e-collar trained, no reactive on the leash anymore, but I can't seem to get past her resource guarding issue, mm. which is only with dogs, not people. I've been working with her by putting her in the crate with the e-collar mm. on, having other dogs approach the crate with food in it, and correcting her firmly with the e-collar at the first sign of guarding. Good. Any other suggestions, or just keep doing these exercises? I like that you're being so proactive yeah, and really going like, after it. Yeah. Smart stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so this is going to be very similar to what I recommended um, early uh, earlier today about the two dogs that get scrappy when the when the border cub gets a little bit lively and excited, and the, the boxer the, cub, the German Shepherd um, Dobie, um, <laughs> goes goes after it. Um, so so here, here's what I here's what I recommend, and once again this the same the same um, caveat or the same um, preface is going to be I'd prefer you do it with a, with a professional if you can find somebody to help you that really knows what they're doing that would be my my highest recommendation just for safety and all that if that's not a possibility then get back into um, into the the protocol that that I would do if your dog was here which is basically <clears throat> we've got uh, We've got the submissive dog resource guarding around the other dog around food, crumbs, anything it finds. Um, uh, dogs are e-collar trained, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah. Um, that means muscle conditioning, just like our, what I recommended in the other one. So um, if the other dog is stable and it's just the submissive one, that's the main... Um, um, uh, uh, aggressor. Aggressor. Um, then that would be the one that I would muzzle condition at, at the very least. And then I would keep a long line on and let the dog just kind of drag it around. <clears throat> and then I would either set situations up, which means like sprinkling some stuff on the floor when you're, I mean, it's really the best way to go is setting it up so you're, you're, you're really proactive and you're geared up and ready, like consciously, you're like mm -hmm. studying the scene and ready to move on stuff. And then see if you get any of that kind of stuff. Now your dog being on a long line and being muzzled up means that your dog's safe and can't damage the other dog. Mm -hmm. If you do the muzzle conditioning correctly, like we said, use Josh Moran's muzzle, muzzle, con muzzle conditioning video and, and really spend like, you know, uh, a week or two and getting the dog comfortable with it, then you're, you're liable to get a more normal response out of your dog um, than it being like shut down with the, the muzzle and being weird. So you get that, get a long line on, your dog can't hurt the other dog, you're ready, you've sprinkled like, you can take some kibble and you can just like toss it on the floor and, um, and see what you get. And if you start to get, you know, tension, posturing, like the precipice of the dog's gonna go after the other dog, or the dog actually commits to going after the other dog, it's a high level correction. It's a, don't do that anymore. It's, I get that you don't like that. I get that you don't want the other dog there. I get, I, but it doesn't matter. What matters is don't do that anymore. And I wanna create an inhibition against that choice, right? So yes, that's uncomfortable stuff. It's a higher level e-collar correction and it means you know, your dog might vocalize and it might not look pretty for a moment, but having continuous dog fights and dogs going to the vets and possibly possibly worse than that is not pretty either. So um, that's, that's the protocol that I would go through. I would go through like proactively setting it up, um, making sure that I have a chance to address it. And what I wanna do is say, when you make that choice, it becomes one of the most uncomfortable things in the world that's ever happened. And then your dog goes, Next time that dog walks by me, I'm, I don't even want to do that. And then on top of that, you have to 
in just regular life be conscious of watching and seeing if that stuff starts to go down when you're not setting it up and be really like, you know, eagle eye um, on, on the situation, Johnny on the spot, and make sure that if you do see any weirdness that you're going after it. Yeah. That said, I'd be going after creating a ton of like structure and rules for both your dogs, but especially the, the more submissive one in general, like just comprehensively, I would be looking to get that dog in a real like listening, more stable, confident in a positive way. I mean, always just correcting just the issue um, can leave holes if you're not addressing things more universally. So we always do both. I was just talking with Sarah, the, the shadow student here today, that we have two major approaches, right? So we've got the state of mind, comprehensive training, the foundation training we do with every dog, and that works out like 90% of problems and if you know dogs are growling at people or barking or being reactive and uncomfortable and stressed and anxious and weird it tends to take like 99 percent of that stuff out um but then if we have specific things that have more a deeper trigger to them a deeper like emotional response then often those need to be addressed specifically and that's like you know like dog to dog aggression or resource guarding uh towards people or other dogs or, or what have you and so those need to be addressed specifically so that would be my recommendation like I said, that can be a hard one um, to do if you're not familiar with doing it yourself. That's why having a pro on board would really help. But the, the truth of the matter is, if you want to get a dog to stop doing something that has a big, deep emotional like driver behind it, there has to be a, uh, an equally deep anti-driver. You know, We have to create an, an equally deep inhibition about doing that. So the dog goes, I don't want to do that anymore, even though I'm really driven to guard this or clean this dog's clock. So that's, that's the answer. Muzzle condition, e-collar's already on, um, a long line on the dog so you can control the dog. Just watch the situation, throw some kibble around, and when you get it, you go after the, other, go after the dog that does it, and you correct high, and I, once again, I would correct for a couple seconds, um, holding the button, letting the dog know that's a real, real bad choice. Yeah. Um, and then if you think the other dog might redirect and go after the other dog, then you have to muzzle condition that dog, too. Great. This is a this is an ugly show. This is the show of like serious business. I'm gonna get like labeled a bad guy. You already are. No, oh, that's terrible. We are. We all are. Yeah. We just have to accept it. Just accept our, our fate. <laughs> the the truth is that there's not much to, <coughs> not much talk about this stuff no. out there, mm -mm. and um, and I'm sure it's it, it it will ruffle some feathers talking about this stuff. E callers already have a bad yeah, rap. But, but we're we're just trying to do our best to be honest do. about. <laughs> just, I'm so annoyed. How can you do? No. No, you're so annoyed with what? I wanted to hear that. So I'm annoyed, annoyed with, with, I'm just... People not being transparent about yeah, it. Yeah, well, not even, I mean, transparent, but it's like, okay, like, we're just, this is it. This is what we got. This is what we're doing. This is what you guys are doing and having great success. I've, you know, hopefully the, 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 you know, landscape is changing. Is that the right word? That could be the right word. I mean, our gardener is going to be here tomorrow, and he'll, he'll make sure everything is cleaned and tidy. So, What's the um, word I was looking for, Sarah? Yeah, the that landscape. The landscape yeah. or the, the dynamic of the world is yeah, shifting yeah, yeah. to you being more landscape. okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just making fun, giving you a hard time. Yeah, uh, it's, it's tough stuff to talk about, and, um, and that's... It's definitely stuff that I would love to have a pro on hand because it's yeah. it's more challenging work. But I know not everybody has the access to somebody that they trust, that they know knows how to do this, um, or has them close, or has the funds for it. So I applaud everybody trying to do their best work. I just want to make sure everybody's as careful and cautious as possible. And as long as you do good work with muzzle conditioning and you've got the right muzzle fit and all that good stuff, there's a pretty high level of safety going on, yep. right? To where things can only fall apart so much. And then a long line obviously helps you like, you know, control the dog while that stuff goes on as well. And so these are kind of advanced maneuvers, um, but we're, we're, we're working really hard to try and empower people with as much honest uh, information as possible about what we've seen work. So, cool. Is it landscape? What environment? Um, so, like, you know, no, you, would, you could say like the dog training this landscape. Stuff, like a, this stuff? This you're seeing the, no, like it's you're seeing it changing, right? Yeah, but it's like the. No, I mean, I think you, I think the word's right on. I think just you're thinking about it too much, and it's becoming a different word now. Yeah, we gotta speed. We gotta up. come on, lady, speed it up. Question. <laughs> Where are we? I don't know. Number eight. What did we do, Wendy? 
We did Wendy. Yep, we need Kim Bergerson. Oh, okay. Kim Bergerson says, my uh, question number eight. Yep. My dog seems to be more aggressive on leash when she sees a stranger than off. What? What's up with that? What? Kim, that's crazy talk. Yes. Um, okay, so it's not crazy talk. No. It's, it's real not. talk. Ready for real talk? Yeah. Okay. Real talk corner. Where's our Kelly when we need him for real talk? Um, anyways, dog is more aggressive on leash around strangers than off. Uh, what's the deal? It's a real common situation, right? So leashes make dogs more stressed out. We were covering this with another question earlier. Um, dogs are trapped, right? So they're stuck on leash. So if a dog, like imagine the dog was just like freely walking with you and saw somebody and didn't like them. The dog can move like two, three feet around to walk away, can move around, create space and bubble, a bubble himself and then feel cool. But he knows he's on leash. He knows he's got to now walk by that person. And so that creates accelerated or uh, I think accelerated, um, exacerbated stress or, you know, higher levels of stress, which cause dogs to get freaked out and then bark and do all that stuff. So the, the, being, the being stuck or trapped on leash is a part of it. And then another thing we see when dogs are on leash a lot of times, especially if they're not getting enough direction and um, kind of like, firm leadership and, 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 and rules on the walk and in other contexts, we can see uh, protective guarding stuff go on, right? So if the dog is feeling loosey-goosey and nervous and then somebody comes around, he's on leash, and then all of a sudden your, your walk, your little bubble on your walk almost becomes like moving territory, right? So you know how dogs will get territorial about like, you know, front yard, backyard, your front door, windows, and things like that. Well, you guys on this leash become this little bubble of like, hey, this is our moving front yard. And then so you get dogs that are starting to get weird about that and they can get, they can get protective as well about that stuff. So that's the answer. We got the leash issue, um, which makes them stressed out, worried, not as safe, not as confident. And then we've got, um, what was the other part? Um, and then we've got the protective part of that. Um, which can also exacerbate things. So the best way to, to, to fix that, because most of the dogs come in here have that exact same issue, is to walk your dog in a structured fashion using the right tools, leash and prong or e-collar or both, depending on what your needs are, um, and have your dog walk in a structured heel and give them information with corrections about don't bark at that guy, don't do that, and that stuff goes away really quickly if you use the right tools and use the right approach. But if you allow your dog to be like, there's a guy in our neighborhood neighborhood who walks, uh, nice guy I'm sure, but he walks his dog on a, on a harness and the dog is like, looks like a young kind of mix, like, I don't know, 50, 60 pound mix. And I can see in the dog's eyes how desperately the dog needs a little bit of guidance in the right tool. But because the harness is there, the dog feels emotionally and physically disconnected from its owner. And what he does is every time he sees somebody, he gets tense. <laughs> And he does this stuff, dogs walk by, he does the same thing. And the owner's like, oh crap, I gotta move him away. And he gets worried about it. But he doesn't have any way to connect or communicate with this dog because the tool inhibits that. Mm -hmm. So basically the dog is, law, is, is, is isolated, the human's isolated, and everybody's just trying to figure it out on their yeah. own. I guarantee you, if you hand me that dog and a leash and a prong collar, in five minutes I can be, and I'm not bragging, I'm just saying like that's how Probably easy that stuff works. Probably most of the people that ask questions on this could handle that situation. Yeah, yeah, most people that, answer, that, that have asked questions that have already done homework could take that guy's dog and in a few minutes probably get that dog in a space where he's yeah. not in that reactive thing. It's just a stressed out dog. It's what I keep trying to convey to everybody. If you don't walk your dog, I mean, of course there's cream puffs out there that don't need any help, but if you don't walk your dog in a structured fashion and your dog is struggling with reactivity, nervousness, stress, anxiety, protective, whatever, mm -hmm. then you're doing your dog a disservice because he's isolated on his own and trying to figure it out on his own. He's just freaking out. So. Uh, go to our website, www.thegooddog.net, watch the free videos. All you would have to do is get a prong on that dog and watch our, wa watch our walk video and really adhere to the rules on that and then correct for any of that stuff. And if your dog is a more serious customer, get the e-collar on board and the same rules apply. Strict heel, strict rules about how the dog walks, dog starts to get barky, huffy or anything like that at somebody, correct and say no. And your dog goes, I can't do that anymore. I feel more stable because you walk and tell me what to do. Thank God someone showed up. Mm -hmm. Now I can just relax and chill out on my walk. Woo, look at you go. I'm fine, I'm fired today. Thanks. We got Sean. Sonier. Oh, 
Question number nine, oui. Sean Sonnier. 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 Sean says, <laughs> I have a Please rescue. Stop butchering my name. <laughs> I have a rescue for about five years now. Evidently, he was not treated well before me, properly by a man. Mm -hmm. He's a Roddy Shepherd mix. It took him a long time to come around to my grown son who lives with me, mm. but he finally has to an extent. He'll sit on Cameron's lap and be buddies one moment, but then when Cameron opens his bedroom door to come out, he freaks out and barks, hair standing on end every time for five years. Mm. How do I get him to stop? Sean, this sounds like 90% of the dogs that come in here. Yeah. Right? So we get this so often. What you've got is you've got an insecure, nervous dog, not getting enough information, and it just kind of keeps getting locked in the cycle of like, I feel comfortable here, and then, oh God, the door open, and I'm like, it's like old habits. Mm -hmm. Oh God, who are you? And, and Barky, you know, it's just nervous stuff. Yep. And the way we fix that stuff is by doing just like a simple comprehensive training program, whether you do it with leash and prong or e-collar, and you teach the dog like, We've got this. We're in control in the house. You've got rules. You've got boundaries. You've got structure. Go lay in place for an hour and a half. Don't wander the house freely. And I will give you all the information you need to live and, and move through this world comfortably. When that happens, we see that stuff stop. When it doesn't happen, you see dogs stuck in a cycle of nervousness because they're not getting enough information from their owner about how to live comfortably in this world. And I'm not putting anything on you. I'm just saying, like, in general, that's what we see. And then we see it regularly, consistently go away with just some simple protocols. So if I was you, I would just, uh, you know... Uh, it's either leash and prong from from our from our standpoint. It's either leash and prong program, sit down place, um, and 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 heal, or it's an e collar program, sit down place, heal, and then you get the added really good thing of of uh, really reliable, dependable recall, and then that can really change the game when the leash is gone and your dog is super responsive. So this involves a little bit of training. If this is a big priority, if you really want to move your dog through it, if it's a small annoyance and you're like, yeah, it's really annoying that he barks at my son, you know, like consistently, but you don't feel it's dangerous and you're not motivated, then it's going to be hard to kind of jump into a whole program. But if it's a pain point and you're like, man, I really want this gone, then either get a pro on board to help you that does balanced training, or get our prong collar foundation DVD, or get into our do-it-yourself um, free videos and really jump in and, and do it yourself. And if you do follow those simple things, those simple protocols, like read the blog and that stuff, mm -hmm. and this stuff is all like, that's why we put it all out there so you guys can do it yourself and solve most of these issues. Because dogs like that, they're not serious customers. Mm -hmm. They're dogs that are stuck and nervous and they just need some more help. And so if you'll add that help through structure rules and training, you can see them like really like move past that. Now, if you had him on e-collar and you did that program, then the next time he comes out, if he, if, if he growls at your son or barks at your son or anything nervous, you just correct and say no. Call him back, put him in place. And he goes, oh, wow, mm -hmm. cool, I'm not supposed to do that. But if he was sitting in place and you've been practicing place command, and you were do, being really proactive about it, and he was, you know, spent you know, a couple hours a day in various place commands, you probably wouldn't see that same reaction. You'd see a dog less loosey-goosey, like the whole roaming around when dogs are unbalanced is really bad stuff for them. So lock them down, put them in like a real secure kind of like, this is what I want, this is what I want, don't move from here. You'll see dogs like more confidence, more stability, sun comes walking out, I don't really care about it. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's kind of the answer, why, why um, well not why that's happening, well actually why it's happening, yeah. and then how to go about sorting it out as well. Do McClanahan. Yes. We've got that. Okay. Ugh. Laura's a little under the weather, little, but she's fighting to stick with us, right? A little bit, yes. We've got question number 10. Did from, you burn your sinuses with extra hot Indian probably. food? Is that what happened? It's Maybe probably. Some what curry happened. stuck up here. Uh, <laughs> I could actually use some super hot Indian food to kind of like cleanse oh, it. Neti pot style? Yeah. Okay. Chicken, this is from curry, neti inst pot. Instagram. This is... Handle Do McClanahan. Mm -hmm. Do says, every once in a while my dog will destroy something when I'm out of the house. Usually some papers, a box, a package, etc. But it only happens like once every few months. But it makes me nervous not to crate to not crate him when I'm out, even though he doesn't need to be for the most part. Mm -hmm. How do I stop these behaviors since I'm not there to catch him in the act? Please don't say don't leave anything around. <laughs> we live in an apartment and there just isn't enough space to put every single item in my life into a storage place. Do you took out our, our golden answer? Oh, that was our perfect answer. Don't leave anything answer. around, do. Um, so uh, 
Here's what I do. Uh, it's a, I, it's a, oh, did you want to jump in? No, I was just going to say, here's what I do. Do. Here's what I do do. Um, children, running a little episode <laughs> show here, a little Q&A show. Um, anyways, so here's what I get into. Um, I would create your dog when you're, do when you're not home. Um, even though this is only happening sporadically, your dog's not ready yet. I mean, the, the rules that we generally give about, about crate stuff mm -hmm. is that once your dog is, is consistently, and I mean consistently, not like every couple of months, but it's consistently not soiling or destroying or getting into trouble, then you can remove the crate and you can have a look and see how the dog does. Mm -hmm. um, but your dog's still getting into trouble um, kind of sporadically. So I'd say it's just not time yet to, to lose the crate. And it sounds like you've already got a crate, so that's cool. And your dog's already probably comfortable with it. So instead of feeling bad about like, oh, we're crating him when we're gone, feel good about it that you're actually giving your dog some structure and that he doesn't have to be anxious. Most of that stuff is either happening from boredom or anxiety when you're yeah. gone. And so he's just trying to find a way to appease and, and, and uh, pacify himself. Yeah. Now the flip side of this or the other side of this that can be pretty scary is that dogs can get into serious trouble if they ingest the wrong thing, right? So he could, um, or he or she could eat something that's toxic um, get himself in trouble, or he could get an obstruction, you know, chewing a sock or something like that. These things can be super pricey, they can be life-threatening, and in the worst case scenario, your dog gets into like a bag, you know, a friend of ours who's a trainer um, was just was talking about a couple people recently who lost their dogs because dogs had, had not been crated and put their head in like a potato chip bag and then couldn't get it off, or any other kind of bag, you know? And then the dog suffocates because they panic and they can't get the bag off their head. So, not to put like the heavy spin on it, but it's like there's, you know, until dogs are really, really stable with that, um, you, you kind of have to be a, a little bit, you have to be on the precautionary train to make sure if you want to be super, super confident and safe that your dog doesn't get into trouble. That's what I would do. I would say you don't have to keep things out and, and move things away from your dog, but when you're not home and you can't supervise, your dog needs more help. Yeah. Not, not quite ready yet. Yeah. Yeah, and like, I don't know if the dog's e color trained or anything like that, but... You could also set something up or put a little camera, but that's yeah, more work I mean that's for that's occasional. That's more work. I would say like it's it's probably a it didn't, I don't know if you said how old the dog was, but it's probably just some youthful stuff. Yeah, I Manny mean, does stuff. Every yeah, once I mean a while, we even so even my guys, you know, will occasionally get into into trouble, and mm -hmm. so what I do with Manny is. I don't crate him, but Manny is, it gets less, less space. He's one of my newer dogs and he's in the bedroom when I'm gone. My other two don't get into trouble, so they've got free reign, right? If Manny was destroying stuff in the bedroom, then he'd definitely get crated. But in the bedroom, he's more limited. He feels less anxious and less inspired to kind of get into trouble. So he just sleeps. And that's kind of what we're looking for is keep yep. the dog safe until the dog is safe. Yep. Cool? Cool. Do? McClanahan. Do it, do. Okay. Poor sick Laura. No, I'm not. Poor sick Laura. No, what I'm saying is it's just more frustrating. No, I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm being supportive and empathetic. Thank you. There you go. Are you ready for the next question? Question number 11. This is from my favorite handle on Instagram, Cujo and Cray. Cujo and Cray. My hope is that Cray is just the shorthand for crazy. Oh, it's Claudia. Yeah. Uh, Oh my gosh, this dog is insanely cute. Roddy. I just love Instagram because it's just all dogs all the time. Oh my gosh, she went to a Kenny Chesney concert. Okay. <laughs> Claudia, She's talk like, later. I didn't want my my information exposed <laughs> well, in my personal life. Well, open. not to not to the Q and A. Oh, sorry. She's like, Instagram's cool, but your Q and A. I don't want people <laughs> know so it. It's, it's a dodgy <laughs> audience. Cujo and Cray says. Yep. My dog hates the e-collar. Mm. Ugh, he won't go on walks with one on, and I swear I've never zapped him out of his mind. <laughs> We're very happy about that. Claudia. Yeah. I do low-level collar training with him, and he's fairly obedient, but least reactive towards dogs when walking. Mm. He'll wear it when we go in the car and the beach, but not for walks. He just goes and lays down once I put it on. Mm, 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 mm. Claudia. I thought at first, sorry, oh, sorry, it was too tight, but I still could get two fingers under it. Could he just be that he just doesn't like to walk? I can't really practice training his leash reactivity unless he'll walk. You guys are awesome. 
I wish you could send, I could send you care packages every week, LOL. Aww. Aww. Any advice would be appreciated. Safe travels back home from Eno. Oh, oh awesome. Out. Thanks, Claudia. Thanks, Claudia. Okay, so what's probably happening is that you, you say that in a certain context, he's comfortable with it, right? The car and going to the beach and things like that. So what I would surmise is that the walks are the times where he's being corrected because that's where the behavior problems are, right? So you said he's reactive on leash still, but he's probably cool in the car. And so he's like, cool, the association is e-collar goes on when we're going in the car and I know it's going to be fun and there's no, like, anything I don't like. Yeah, but the walk, be obedience in the house and right. things are fine. Yeah, yeah, but there's no, no, pressure. there's no pressure or real challenges. Right. But on the walk where I like to get goofy and have a hard time, then I'm gonna get corrected, and so I'd rather just skip the walk. I'm yeah. just not into that. No, so I'm okay with that. what I would say is that that's most likely where it's coming from. I wouldn't put a whole lot of weight on it. I wouldn't, you know, it's not from the snugness of the collar. I've never, I've never had a dog that that wouldn't walk because of the snugness of the collar. I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying like you can kind of take that off your off yeah. your your mental the list. The 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 uncomfortableness of the actual physical collar we can take off the kit. Yeah, the yeah, that's that's not a not an yeah. issue. So what I would do is um, I would probably just do the the Jeff Gelman let's go yep. <laughs> and that means like we're just gonna walk and I wouldn't be putting anything on on the dog of like oh he doesn't want to walk it's like we're gonna go for a walk yep. prong collar on e collar on let's go and we're gonna we're gonna take off and it's make that a non-negotiable yeah. and and it's just like if your dog doesn't want to walk, you know nothing bad is going on except that your dog's got some issues with the walk. And so he's like, oh, I don't want to go out there and like if I've got to get corrected. But like that's real life. You have to go out there. we got to work on your behavior. Um, we get dogs all the time that have, you know, never been on e-collars. we got lots of reactivity stuff and we have to work them through reactivity. And yes, they get corrected for getting nasty with dogs. Yeah. But they all go. Even if they don't want, we're going to go. And so the more the dog feels it can push back and that you're like, oh, he doesn't like the walk anymore, the more he's going to be like, cool, I'll just sit here and, and yeah. do that. And we'll skip this thing because I don't like going to school, right? Yeah. But it's, no, we're going to school. We're going to do this until we get this right. Yeah. And what will happen is as his behavior gets better and better and better and he learns the walk is non-negotiable, he'll stop being like, let me see if I can not go for a walk. And he will be getting less and less corrections because he'll be getting better. And then it'll just be what it is and it'll just be a, a better walk in a cool situation. Yeah. So it's kind of like a kid that like doesn't want to go to school but is happy to go to like IHOP and... Chuck E. Cheese. Chuck E. Cheese and yeah. that sort of thing. Like it's yeah. kind of, that's a really broad example to compare it to, but it's got that same thing. We get dogs, we see all the time that owners are like, yeah, they, they're they like happy to do this. They're, they're totally cool with this. But then in this situation, they're not, you know, and since we can't like see maybe manipulation in dogs yeah. quite the same yeah. way, we get, we get confused. But I would say that it's less of a, is your collar. suspicion that there's a bit of a manipulating dog going on here? Well, I mean... No, just gut instinct. Gut instinct, yes. Yeah, I mean, me the, the gut instinct is that this dog is like, no, I don't want... If, if you're going to control me on the walk, then no, I don't want to go. Yeah. It's got that kind of flavor to it. So Because yeah. usually, like, really soft, soft dogs aren't super reactive on walks. No. Really soft dogs are would be, like, nervous, but they're, they don't tend to be, like, really demonstrative and reactive. So you tend to get, like, you can have anxious, nervous dogs, sure. but that they're very reactive, but not usually, like, soft-compliant dogs. Yeah, and if you had said, like, he hates the e-collar, he's perfect in every way, but hates the e you know what I mean? Yeah, and then yeah, then yeah. it'd be like, oh, that, okay, maybe there's, like, a sensitivity issue, maybe you need to go way lower than where you are, maybe we need to have the collar on at all times, maybe there was bad experience before that you don't know about, you know, yeah. that, none of that's real. But the fact that you said, like, he hates the e-collar, he's leash reactive. It's like, oh, <laughs> he's being a jerk. Yeah. He doesn't want to be controlled, you right, know? Right, right. So it's the one tool maybe that's finally broken through to him. Um, we see the same thing with prong collars. Oh, yeah. We see a dog like, oh, and, and people, will, people will infer that oh, the dog doesn't like the prong collar. Oh, my gosh. He's scared of the prong collar. It's yeah. making him worse. It's shutting him down. The dog's like, oh, crap. I can't do what yeah, I, normally I, can't do do. What I normally do. This do. stinks, right? And it's like, too bad. I have we, a funny we, story. Yeah, lay it on the, lay it on us. So Polar Bear was the first dog I ever saw put on a prong because that was my dog that Sean came to help me with. He was always in your hair. He was always in my hair. Um, <laughs> little polar Bear. Hair always in my hair so he he was the first dog I ever saw like be put on a prong 
And Sean warned me before because polar bear was, let's just say, wasn't... King of brats. Yeah, a king of bratty, like, a-hole behavior stuff. Sorry. <laughs> I'm glad you said language. it. Glad you said it. Yeah. Glad you said it. A-hole. So, and <laughs> he was like eight months probably when you were working with him And biting everybody. So let's yeah, be like, clear. What, let's, let's define it a, a, a-hole. Yeah, yeah. A-hole means like stalking you around the house to bite you if you like come out of your room. You if like you're eating pizza, you know, on, on your table. Like coming over, grabbing the pizza and then like guarding it and biting yeah. you if you try and guarding take it the back. Water. We couldn't go, we couldn't walk in the kitchen when he was drinking water out of his bowl. Okay. This that is... that fits into a-hole category, <laughs> right? And then biting the crap out of her own walks too. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the, so the first time that I saw him be put on a prong, Sean said, you know, because he knew what kind of dog he was, he said, you know, uh, you might get some protest stuff. You might get alligator rolls because he was used to just running the walk. You might get, you know, I might get alligator rolls. You might crocodile go up rolls. on the, I call oh, I'm sorry, crocodile rolls. rolls. I might come up on the leash, you know, yeah. you might come up on the leash, yeah. do all this stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. And then he did all of that. Right? Times 10. Times a million. Yeah. And Sean was like, wow. And, and, I, and I just like, sat oh. there and watched, right? Yeah. Basically, just, we just sat there and he just like, yeah, yeah. As, soon as, as soon as he felt the prong, the yeah. he was like, oh God, <laughs> this is the end of my reign. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> and then he was reign. like, maybe if I spin, roll, scream, and, exactly. and bite the leash, this thing will pop off and we'll be back. Right. We're good. We'll be good. But, but then the funny part about this was that. I thought that every dog reacted to a prong collar like that. So when I started working for Sean and we started like working with dogs on prongs and putting them on prongs, and I remember this one, the first dog that I saw after that, that he put on a prong, he put it on the prong and didn't tell the owners like, oh, there might be crocodile rolls and stuff. And I was like, oh God, I was like, we didn't, we didn't let them know how it's going to be. And the dog, of course, was a sweetheart and was like, oh, brown collar, da, 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 no problem. Yeah. But I was like, wait, don't all dogs go crazy when they come yeah. out of the tool? So what did, you, what did you glean from that? Exactly what maybe perhaps Cujo and Cray are going through. Which is a little attitude -y stuff. We're, 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 you know, we're making some leaps here because yeah, uh, we, don't, we don't know. But that could definitely be part of the situation is that you've got a dog who's not digging being controlled for the first time. It's just like, oh, we'll just sit this walk yeah, out. That's because, not, uh, yeah, that's not I, I, happening for me. Yeah you, you, yeah, you tell me what to do. Or he could be a little stressed out about it, right? So yeah. he could be a softer dog and he could be like, oh, I'm stressed out because I go out on the walks. I don't, I'm not doing well with dogs and I'm getting corrected and yeah. that bums me out. Either way, I would just say, like, I mean, because you could be like, well, let's recondition him to the e-collar and feed him donuts every time we, you know, take him out on walks and stuff like that. But I really don't think that that's going to help because yeah. what's happening is you need to correct him for that behavior and he needs to be accountable and yeah. compliant. So we kind of need to, like, train him fairly, hold him accountable, and also say, like, it's not not, yeah. not negotiable. We're going for this walk. So I would just jump out there, make it happen, and I'd say in a, in a I was going to say in a couple months, but it might even be shorter than that if you're like really like, hey, we're just going, let's go. Mm -hmm. You'll you'll find that you're, this guy will most likely just give up that resistance yep. and be like a walking dream. Yep. yep. Cool. cool. Okay, question number 12 from Instagram. This is our final, I know we did an extra two, but that's because we skipped a week. That's and... because we're giving. We're oh, givers. we're giving. We're, yeah, givers. we're givers. Yeah. And right. um, givers that. give. We really do. We give a lot. Okay, so question 12 from Soccer Sora on it's Instagram. It's a long one. It's actually it is. I'm gonna, but it's I'm really gonna... cool. So what I want you to see is that Soccer Sora wants to become a dog trainer, wants to go to T3. It's really inspired. So you, you should read a little bit yeah, of that and I see will. what's cooking. Okay, I know. I, no, it's a good one. Hey, Sean and Laura. I know you get this a lot, but thanks for everything you do. Aw. Yeah. The thing that motivates me most and I love about your videos is the personality. You guys have a great personality Aww. Aww. and are always in an upbeat mood and it's super contagious. <sighs> That's so nice. That nice. We are, I mean, it's not put on, I'll tell you that much. We eat a dozen donuts right and before we, just we like, start. Like, bring your dog, bring your dog. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, no, really, we love our life. Okay, here's my long question. We love our life. <laughs> I just turned 21 and I still live at home as a part-time pet sitter because it mm. allows me to spend more time with my dogs, fosters, and volunteering at the shelter with rescues and trainers. Nice. I'm saving up to do the T3 and Shadow program with you guys, so hopefully Man. I get to do one of them this year. Yay! Right. That's I awesome. I have 
fostered about 10 to 12 dogs in the past year and wanted to become a dog trainer about 8 to 10 months ago when I realized how many people are scared of aggressive dogs and don't help because they're too scared to be bit and we need more people like you guys so that's my goal mm, wow. awesome sauce that is so cool yeah it really is I have fostered, dealt with a human aggressive dog, um, human aggressive dog aggressive, fear aggressive, resource guarding, separation anxiety, hurt himself to get out of the crate, long story, I can send you that in a different email. Um, I'm volunteering with some local rescue shelters to help out with an aggressive dogs because they can't afford trainers and even if I can't fix the aggression entirely, I can at least fix the re leash reactivity and foundation, everything with your videos. Um, Awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. If you can't fit, fix the whole picture, at least you can start chipping away. It's such a good, good idea. Um, my dogs, uh, owned and fosters are all prong and off leash e-collar trains. And I've been taking them downtown <laughs> and to parks and stuff for off leash. And they get a lot Sarah? of attention. That's so cool. I know. So here's my actual question. What should my next step be? Everyone says I'm on the right path, but other than just finding a live vol in a live in volunteer position that pays enough just for food, which I've been looking for um, as willing to move across country for. I'm in Orlando, Florida. I don't know what to do. I'm starting meditation and personal development to help with any personal issues. Love the answer you guys gave on one of the Q&As on your personal development books. That's awesome. I've listened to every Q&A and have them on my iPhone to listen to 24-7. Hope Man. you guys choose this extremely this might long be a question. Super fan. I have a great have a great day, guys. Awesome. Oh, that's so super duper cool. Real quick, just to PS. I'm twenty one <laughs> and I don't party, clubs, drink, smoke, drugs, etc. I have five super close friends and other than that I'm only with dogs or dog trainers and enthusiasts to dive into the lifestyle so I don't get distracted wow. from my goal because I have no desire for anything else. <laughs> There's just something about being with dogs that not many people understand, and that's why I'm willing to go to any extent to get to my goal. I can't and won't have a job not involving dogs. Wow. wow I, don't think, I don't think there's anything that's going to stand in your no, way. You're, you're I done, think you're gold. Soccer. You're done. Um, soccer Sora. Soccer Sora. Look we out, always, Florida. We always, we always talk about drive being the big determining factor yes. in, in success, that knowledge, talent, all that stuff is all kind of very, very much secondary. And, mm -hmm. and if you've got the drive, man, it's all, it's all done. It's in the it's bag. Easy. It's, it's just a matter. A, it's just yeah. a matter of time. It's a foregone conclusion. Not even a question. So, um, what? It's the second Laura's no. secret. I can't remember what my acronym. Laura's secrets. No. Surprise, surprise secret, question. surprise secret question. So that means Laura's answering this one. I just figured question. you'd be the right one. Okay. Well. I love that you're contemplating T3 or a shadow. That is so cool. I would say start with T3 for sure because yeah. that's much more starting from the, you know, the very overview, base yeah. overview, yeah. everything, marketing, you know, business, setting it all up, all that stuff. So bang, boom, email me about that whenever you're ready for that. Yeah. Um, in the next whatever, couple of years. The other thing or months. Or months, I mean, yep. You I might mean, be on the express train. It definitely. It's pricey, though. So I was just saying, yeah. you know, she's yeah, like yeah, saving yeah. money. Um, PayPal. PayPal Pay credit. Letter. You can do, you can apply for a credit plan and get a six months no... No interest. Interest, no yeah. payments. Yeah, a lot of t do that. Yep. It's really great. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So, for me, if you're living with your parents and you're able to do dog work on the side... I mean, doing, just doing dog walking in the way that we talk about it and doing the working with shelters and taking your dogs out and getting yourself out there. I mean, you could start building your own business right now doing all that stuff. Yeah, we've had, we have T3ers that are doing it just that way. Yeah, like I mean, and, yeah, you yeah. could do, you could get all this stuff started. By the time you get to T3, you've got videos you've got a social media presence yep. you've got tons of hands on with dogs yeah. yeah and then you walk into t3 and we solidify it all for you instead of like okay i'm gonna wait till t3 and then i'm gonna get it going it's like no get it going now you've got a shelter on board obviously yeah. you're doing a little work with them you could do a ton of before and after videos not just for the marketing but like hey guys look what we can do we can yeah. fix leaks reactivity we can help we spread can the help word. these guys yeah. yeah and then you can um Doing the dog walking, that's how Sean got started. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to get your hands on dogs and really get more experience because the more dogs you get your hands on, the better trainer you're going to be. Absolutely. Dog walking did a lot for me. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Especially in the structured way, like we say. Mm -hmm. And it's also um, a cool thing as you transition into training, 
uh, a good way to like financially do some dog walking and then training and yeah. you kind of like in, until you can get into a full training thing the dog walking can absolutely help sustain you financially yep um i was just gonna say you might want to i don't know if if, if it's is it female i think soccer sora yeah. i don't yeah. know maybe so uh soccer sora i don't know uh um if you're familiar with uh with uh tori smith no well tori smith but um junior mendoza Oh, Nelson. Nelson, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So just, just to kind of like, if you're not familiar with Nelson, just to kind of set some parameters up because you're 21, Nelson is... He's 19 now. 19. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nelson came to T3 at... 18. 18? 17, 18. 17 yeah. or 18. And had his own business running up... Up and running by now. He's got a center. He's yeah, he's got a center. Yeah. He's uh, He employs his parents. Yeah. Um, he's kicking butt and he's not even 21 yet. Yeah. And uh, so, and that's not saying like you're not moving fast enough, but I just want to make sure that I put that out there. Yeah. That, because it can get easy to feel like, oh man, I can't do this until this, this. But I just wanted to put Nelson out as an example of like how fast and, and how early and how young you can move on your dreams if you're driven. And Nelson's really driven. It sounds yeah. like you're right in the same same position as Nelson. So it could be a, a little inspiration for you to go out and, and really boogie on this if you're in that space. And Nelson spent a lot of time interning though as well. Yeah. He, he interned with Jeff Gelman for a long time. He drove from... Massachusetts down to Rhode, Rhode Island, Island yeah. every single day for an entire summer just to work. I think yeah. pretty much for maybe he was paid by the end, but he did he yeah. slogged. And I'm not saying that that you know you have to find a situation like that, but that's just that's you know part of his thing was really creating drive just by doing a lot of that stuff. I was gonna say, you know, you've got Tori Smith in Winter Springs, Florida, who's a amazing uh, trainer. Who, and person and amazing person she actually Tori. yeah she's she, part of the t3 family she, she's a grad but she also works for us too. she also works for t3 um you should contact her directly or email me um because she may you know she's just a great mentor in general but also like i would just try to if you're really looking into like interning or finding some sort of you know semi-paid gig like tori would be a great yeah, one definitely one to check in with yeah jeff gelman might be one just if if you want to reach out to Tori in in Florida and tell her that give her your question <laughs> that you gave yeah. us and see she may not be looking for anything but at least she's someone in the area that um, or in the state that could be you know a good mentor for you but also you can email us um, we're the good dog la no I'm sorry the good, the good dog. dog dot la at gmail dot com um, email us if you want to follow up on this and maybe I can put you in touch with some people that would be loving to have someone like you on the team even for just a couple months to get your feet wet. Yeah, we'd love to help you. I mean, yeah. anybody that's got that kind of drive and nah. determination to go, we'd love You're to help get it. you going. So pretty awesome stuff. Exciting stuff. Yeah, Yay. and and nice, nice all the different things you added, all yeah. those little things about the disciplines and not yeah. drugging and clubbing yeah, and all those awesome. distractions that can really derail people's lives and careers. They're like, oh, it's no big deal, and all of a sudden they're I'm twenty-seven. 35. Yeah, How they're like, oh my here? gosh, I'm still in the bathroom throwing up. Like, yeah, give me a break. <laughs> Hold my hair. <laughs> so uh, that's what girls say. Right? They, they do. Right. They do. Yeah, good, good friends. Yeah. But um, friends but yeah, so super, super proud and impressed by all that stuff, and I would just. I just recommend you you just get rid of any outside like parameters saying like oh you can't do this until then and just mm -hmm. block go yeah. go go, go reach it. out email Laura and then she'll put you in touch with some people that might be able to help you move along mm -hmm. move move forward and get some stuff going and hopefully we'll see you someday at T3 yeah and then we can really rock and roll with that as well and you can always shadow you know Jeff or me whatever yeah. of course here you get Laura too so it's a bonus package well well I'm just saying Anyways, all right. So this has been the longest episode of all time, right? Okay. So we're gonna have to get out of here. Uh, question of the day: We have a dog here, uh, a rescue dog that you can't see. That looks like a boxer, American bulldog, pity something mix, and she's sweet as pie. And our shadow uh, student extraordinaire Sarah is over there working on place command, and and the dog came in with zero training, and so uh, her name is Laika. And so the question is for you history buffs out there, who was Laika, right? There's a, you know, I might be, might be showing my age here, but uh, that's okay. I'm, I'm willing to do it. Laura, do you know who Laika was? Yeah. Okay. So 
showing my age and my wisdom. Um, so that's the question of the day. Who was Leica? I know you guys are going to know this because you're smarty pants. Um, and then if anybody's got any questions from any of this stuff, anybody, even if we didn't address your question specifically, go to www.thegooddog.net and we have a bunch of free videos. Of course, we've got 320 something videos on our, on our The Good Dog Training YouTube channel to dive in if you want to go deeper. But if you just go to the website, our free do-it-yourself videos can help you really get like, I mean, people train their dogs all the time for free like that. So you can do that. You can also order our DVD from that website if you want to go deeper and have more details, more um, more structured to the program that really kind of leads you all the way through it. So our DVD is available in the store there, which is super helpful. Um, it's called the um, Prong Collar Foundation or Learn to Train the Good Dog Way Foundation. What's it called? And, um, and then also phone consults if anybody's interested. Laura, Brittany, and myself all do phone consults. And um, if you're trying to go through like challenging protocols or training things with your dog, we do uh, some pretty awesome phone consult help training mm -hmm. that can kind of fill in the blanks if you're struggling with anything that, that you know, with your dog you're trying to get through. So, yep. guys, that is it. This has been an awesome and exhausting, exhausting session. session. Um, we love and you. We, uh, go. we love you guys. And we'll talk to you guys soon. We'll see you next week. And I'm so proud that we got this done. We got two done this week, which is hard with all of this action. Right Laura's so got to get go. to work. All right. See you guys. Bye.